On the road, riding a two-wheeler, you win and you lose. You tend to remember the victories in particular, especially when they're incredible. Or the tragic failures, those in which we witness the heroes fall, forgetting that the Giro is above all a test of endurance. The 101st edition was expected to be 3,546.2 kilometers long in 21 stages. Out of the 176 athletes arranged on the line of departure, only 149 made it to the end. Among them, in May 2018, there was one who did all three things. He won, even a stage that made us amazed. Putting riders who were legitimately aiming to victory in trouble, like Froome and Dumoulin. He experienced total defeat firsthand. And then he simply did what's expected of any professional on two wheels. He kept pedaling, despite everything. The scene of part of the story is Gran Sasso, a mountain that was faced by riders who came to its slopes with a great desire to win and with a feeling of being able to do it. Some made it, many didn't. On that mountain, you can still hear echoes of the names Gotti, Jalaber, Jimenez, and Pantani. The mountain has a simple rule. If you want to go further, you can't go around it. You have to get to the top. This is in Cima. The greatest Giro d'Italia climbs. Produced by Dagi in association with Agencia Ice for an appreciation of the best that Made in Italy has to offer. Episode 4, Campo Imperatore, Gran Sasso. The promise that admitted it was fallible. The 13th of May, 2018, ninth day of the Giro. The stage that the riders have to face is a long one. 225 kilometers from Pesco Sanita, not far from Benevento, up to Campo Imperatore. At 2,135 meters, going up the country along its backbone of the Apennines. The top of the Apennines is a historic stage. One of the few in that part of Italy. Waiting for the cyclists is a winding road that ends up climbing between meadows and rocky vistas, with the Gran Sasso looking down on you, imposing, as if to warn you. Her peaks loom over to remind of the courage of those who are willing to challenge them. It's a tough stage, but not right away. From Benevento to Rio Nero, Sanitico, there is about a hundred flat kilometers, and that's an endurance test. Then you go towards Rocorazo, overcoming a stretch with a slope of 12%. From there you go down to Sulmona and Popoli, and this is only the iconic prelude to that which will come later. About 45 kilometers interspersed with very short counter slopes, divided in two parts according to the classification of the GPM. The first up to Calascio, and the second one shorter and steeper that ends on the finish line and those final seven kilometers climb up to 2,000 meters above sea level. Enough to put even the strongest rider in trouble. At the start of the stage, a group of 14 sets off in a breakaway. Among them Gianluca Brambilla and Laurent Didier, Giovanni Visconti and Manuele Boaro, Fausto Masnada and Davide Bellarini. And they stay in the lead for most of the path. It's the last 40 kilometers that can surprise them. The group accelerates and someone starts to stay behind. There's one team in particular that sets the pace. It's Astana. Then Fausto Masnada tries to push, but his legs won't hold up. Thanks to that climb with peaks of 
and the strong wind. His lonely escape stops, and he finds himself in the group. The Gran Sasso does not forgive. Then Aru and Froome are left behind. Even the Abruzzese and Giulio Ciccone, who would have had an excellent chance to win right there at home, surrenders. In 2018, he'd have to settle for, so to speak, the second place in the classification Maglia Azzurra, the one that ranks the best climbers. While even the favorites of 2018 give in, there's an athlete that has not only held up, but can still give something. It's Simon Yates. At Campo Imperatore, the 26-year-old from Mitchelton Scott shows that he knows how to get to the end of the race and surprises. In the last 100 meters, he accelerates, overtakes the Frenchman Pinot, and crosses the finish line. As Torriani said, heart and mind behind the Giro since 1949, a sport that lives on the streets needs characters who can ignite the enthusiasm of the people. Yates's story at Campo Imperatore excites the public in that way. On his first lap against all odds, he amazed us. Simon Yates is English and has the proverbial aplomb of England. Journalists press him at the end of the race, surprised by that result. Yates is a revelation. Yes, he wasn't among the favorites. And so they enthusiastically try to understand. Did you expect to end like that? He replies without losing composure. A winner? Yes, but down to earth. He admits it was a fantastic day, but immediately goes on to thank the team. He was working to earn time in the race standings, especially that. But when you push to make up seconds, you risk taking the first place as well. And while the reporter's tone is enthusiastic, Yates seems to have a different awareness. He knows he's running a tough and tricky competition. In Campo Imperatore, he has finished first, but there is still a long way to go. We're on the ninth day out of 21. Waiting for him is a day of rest, and then the longest stage of that 2018. 239 kilometers through the Apennines, going further north. You don't mess about with the Giro. Not even if you've conquered a mountain like Gran Sasso. You can do well for kilometers, demonstrate that you have the right legs and lungs for the race, and then the mountain puts you back in your place anyway, reappraising any ambition. Gran Sasso has done it already, raging against athletes who knew what they were doing and had deservedly worn the Maglia Rosa. That's right, because the one won by Yates on the 13th of May, 2018, is a stage with an important past. For any cycling enthusiast, the climb to Campo Imperatore remains inextricably linked to him. Marco Pantani. Another May of many years earlier on that same road, some gave in and some triumphed. Some were stopped by the mountain, but one, the pirate, Marco Pantani, climbed that same mountain, carrying out a feat destined to enter history. It was unexpectedly cold, strange for May, and there was still a lot of snow on Campo Imperatore. The weather conditions were so critical that the helicopters couldn't take off for aerial shots. The cars and motorbikes were left to follow the cyclists on that damp road. The videos of the time show us banks of low clouds, which limited visibility, giving the illusion that the world ended there with the guardrail. In addition to the asphalt, there were patches of snow on the ground. The air was humid, full of a kind of cold that gets inside you. And there was the climb, of course. The last kilometers of that day on Gran Sasso made great victims. Jalabert gave in, devastated by fatigue. Up until that moment, he'd raised to win, but the Gran Sasso stage was a long one and everything can change. That's how the most demanding days are. Many, many kilometers. And with the uncertainty of the weather, no matter how well it went in the beginning, even racers that start feeling in the best physical condition have the time and the opportunity to find out they can't make it in the end. 
This is what happened to the Frenchman, a few kilometers from the finish line. Many believed in him, but instead, he arrived exhausted on the last summit. There were only a few left at the head of the group. After putting the team in front, Pantani let it be understood that he was ready to give one of his whippings. At this point, Gotti still believed he could make it and tried to go after him. He overtook Pantani one last time, but immediately afterwards, you could begin to notice their two very different physical conditions. The first was resorting to his last strength, while the second still had total control of the race. Pantani let it happen, and then replied by dictating a pace that no one could handle but him. On the most difficult stretch, Gotti still struggled to keep up with him and stay behind Pantani's wheels. But the pirate wasn't worrying about it and looked ahead to the last hundreds of meters that separated him from the finish. Gotti stayed behind, suffering through hell. Pantani looked towards Gotti, looking for an opponent, but found no one. That's when he realized he was left alone. Just then, the pirate turned to look at the road again and began his solo climb, continuing to pick up the pace. A meter and a half distance between the two, and then more, while Pantani took off. The pirate doesn't turn around, he doesn't sit down, he stays standing on the bike. He ignores his opponents, he focuses on the frantic pace, a crazy pace for that climb. On that tongue of asphalt that runs between expanses of snow, he was about to carry out another one of his feats. One of many that have not wrongly been defined as epic. He raced through the cheering crowds of fans who braved the cold to be up there to witness his victory. Gotti's collapse soon became the clear demonstration of Pantani's overwhelming power. Exhausted by the cold and the fatigue, Suffering, defeated by the mountain, he can only watch Pantani perform in one of his legendary escapes together with Zsa, Zsa and the others. He's gone. Pantani is gone. During his commentary, Davide Cassani described Pantani's push as a moral defeat for those who wanted to attack him and who in return got the demonstration that he was the strongest. The boy from Cesanatico with a bandana on his head. But whoever was up there, following the race near the finish line, still couldn't know. Numb, shivering, they heard him coming. The incitement of those further down the path resounded in the valley. And immediately afterwards, he appeared. Him and no one else, standing on the pedals, straight towards the finish line. There were chills of emotion in front of that image that aroused disbelief. Pantani emerged from the snow, from the clouds, like a vision. There was something uncanny about that man alone who faced the climb. Behind him, complete emptiness. This is how the chronicler described it. Those who were there remember wondering if it was really happening. Yes. It was happening. Chills of emotion. One of those days when they will be saying, I was there. These are the words that accompanied that feat, written by the sports reporter of Repubblica the day after. A phrase that still evokes the day of Pantani on Gran Sasso. That day, Marco Pantani ran the 26 kilometers between Fonte Cerreto and Campo Imperatore in 53 minutes and 50 seconds overcoming the 1,371 meters in altitude at an average of over 29 kilometers per hour. Everything was played in about a quarter of an hour. That was enough. I didn't think I could win so easily, he said at the end of the race. On that climb that he'd only studied but never climbed, he knew that a demanding finale awaited him, on which his strength and that of his opponents would be tested. And so it was. He won, while the others were shown their very limits. This is the legacy left behind by the pirates on Campo Imperatore. 
whoever gets there first cannot avoid confrontation with him. Because where Bantani has left his mark, nothing is as it was before. And this, Simon Yates could not ignore. After the Gran Sasso, he gives us more great moments that seem to confirm the tale of the Englishman who's arrived to win. The 16th stage from Assisi to Osimo is his, and then he doesn't give up on the Zoncolan, where he chases Froome and finishes second. Then there are the Dolomites. Yates faces Pasto di Sant'Antonio, Bosco de Giavi, and Cima Sapada without giving up. In short, it stands up to the first. He leaves behind climbers like Pinot and leaves Froome behind again. He resists Dumoulin, the Maastricht butterfly, winner of the 2017 edition. Even for a boy like him, aware of the complexities of that race, at that point, there were good reasons to believe. He held on to the Zoncolan, he conquered Campo Imperatore. What else needs to happen to convince you that this is your Giro? A prelude to what awaits him, however, comes two stages later, in Prato Nevoso. A stage of plain and 15 kilometers of a final slope, which becomes decisive for that edition of the Giro. There they are, the champions Yates surpassed, returning the favor. Pozzo Vivo, Froome, and Dumoulin leave him behind. It can only be a setback, a stage that has not gone as it should have. I didn't feel the same ferocity as before, comments Yates. A phrase that sounds almost like an omen when read again later. But in Prato Nevoso, one can still believe in the Yates phenomenon. 25th of May, 2018, 19th stage, Venaria Reale, Pardonecchia. Some would call her the queen of the Giro. We're in the high mountains, the last finish line uphill. A path that immediately puts you to the test, with the ascent of Col de Listavieux, the descent towards Sousa, and then the hardest moment, that Colle delle Finestre, which is Cima Coppi. A gradient that does not go below 9.2%. A road partly paved and partly unpaved, 45 hairpin turns in total, where he could have been acclaimed among the big names of the year, Yates collapses. He gives in to the climb. You see him suffer. Every pedal stroke is pain. A vertical collapse. It is defeat. There is no other way to describe what happened. The Colle stops him irreparably, with only two stages to go. One climb was enough for the Giro to be lost. 30 minutes behind the stage winner, his compatriot, Froome, also exits the race. It wasn't an opponent to defeat him, not the fierce Froome, not an attack from Lopez, who finished that Giro in third place. Simon Yates was defeated by Simon Yates for reasons that maybe he'll never understand until the end. Simon Yates' dream ends like this. Cycling has seen many debacles in its history. Just a few years ago, there was the Australian Cadell Evans. He arrived at the Giro. He'd conquered the Maglia Rosa, the first Australian to accomplish the feat. But then the stage, starting from Corvara, put an end to the dream. Evans found effective words to describe what an athlete can feel while collapsing. I felt empty. His ordeal on Pasokoe remains the perfect image to describe how raw this sport can be. So Simon Yates is neither the first nor the only one. In fact, what really remains is not his fatigue on Colle delle Finestre, the sprawling ride, the suffering, that half an hour late. But what Yates did next? Being an athlete in a sport where talking about one's limits has never been easy. He comments on the defeat with brave words, saying he was satisfied with what he did despite the failure admitting that he reached the limit and had nothing left to give. 
A rare honesty in a world where champions rarely allow themselves the privilege of fallibility. That Giro 2018 was compromised. After the legs, the mind also gave up. And in the next day, ahead of a desperate ranking, Yates lost again. He'd finished the race in 21st place after having dominated it almost to the end. The images of Pantani's arrival on Gran Sasso come to mind, his triumph and the other champions who surrendered. In a handful of kilometers, Pantani left Jimenez behind by 23 seconds, Ivan Gotti by 33, Halabert by more than a minute. That's all the mountain needs, a few kilometers of road to decree success or defeat. And even in the first case, it's still not over yet. You can feel strong on one summit, but then you get into a crisis afterwards. It's not over until the very end. The 101st edition is the first that starts outside the borders in Jerusalem, ending in Rome. It's a day of victory for Froome and his legendary stage, with an 80 kilometer run on the Colle delle Finestre and then on Jaffro, becoming the first Brit to win the Giro. But it's also the year that that young, promising athlete speaks openly of his defeat, sharing his hardest moments with the public and fans. Then Yates gets back on his bike and resumes racing, winning. For him, 2018 is both the year of his defeat at the Giro and the year in which the Vuelta is taken. Ups and downs. This is cycling. In Cima, the greatest Giro d'Italia climbs, is a Giro d'Italia podcast produced by Doug Ear, starring Daniel Tanner, executive producer Marta Donà and Carlo Lenotti. Written by Valentina Camarini, with the editorial support of Giacomo Botto. Directed by Marco Ferrarini. Producer, Irene Oriani. Sound design and original music by Pasquale Lo Savio. Recording, Dario Cuomo. Artwork, Andrea Lodetti. English adaptation, Diego Ferrarini. Special thanks to Silvia Forestieri, Eva Vicentin, and Simone Pozzi. Una produzione Dogear.